So it's our favorite time of the week because we have Alex Zano of Locked On Canes, and we are going to have some senior superlative style efforts here when it comes to ACC football. We're going to talk about the best, the worst, most improved, and all in between. So maybe it'll be your favorites. We know our YouTube fans love to give us some comments, so very interested, interested to see what Alex has for us on today's show. You are Locked On ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's edition of Locked on ACC. I'm your host, Candace Cooper, joined by Alex Dono of Locked on Canes. Each and every day, you can check out our respective shows wherever you listen to podcasts. More importantly than that, you can subscribe to our YouTube channels. We love it when you guys talk to us because we certainly talk back. We love the comments and all the things. You can follow us on our various social media accounts, and it's always a good time to talk about some ACC football. We are at the end of that thing, but there's bowl season ahead, so we want to reflect a little bit on the regular season. So I brought Alex here and I challenged him with a few superlatives to say, listen, tell me about the best worst and all in between. And I think he has some good ones for us. So Alex, are you ready for this? I'm so ready for this. And this is, if we can keep ACC football alive for at least <laughs> another week with our conversation since, you know, I'm sad the championship game is over and all yeah. that. So I'm looking forward to this. A hundred percent. And listen, ACC trying to be relevant in a time where we are not in college football playoffs is very essential. So I hear you thousand percent before we get into seniors of Perlis, i do have to remind you guys that we have a new coach in louisville mr brahm has decided to come back home which is very exciting and you know i think it's a good opportunity we talked about satterfield yesterday and him pretty much leaving like a thief in the night in louisville not really telling there was i had no idea the way the season played out and how they were fighting i was like okay this man wants to keep his job and keep things rolling but no but Brom is coming in, and he I think he's going to be just fine. What was your you know thoughts to Satterfield leaving and having Brom come in? The Satterfield thing was completely out of left field. <laughs> and we, we exchanged a couple of tweets about it. I was kind of wondering, like, I, I guess he know To me, it's like from the outside looking in, it's like maybe he knows just how, because he's been there for a while now, just how quickly the seat can get hot. So he's kind of, and it reminds me of what Coach Prime said when he was talking with Jackson State. It's like, you know, if you stick around too long anywhere, they'll find a way to terminate you, right? Yeah. But but then you made a great point that, like, it seemed like he saved his job because they finished the season so strong. So, yeah. you know, C Cincinnati, it's not a G5 anymore, Big 12 now, and it, you know, it was, I, I guess, attractive enough of a job that Hartline, you know, interviewed for it. I know Brian Hartline's going to be a hot candidate with what he's doing with the Ohio State receivers and mm -hmm. so you know I got God bless him but you know the Brom thing is important because you know the Louisville ties for Jeff Brom are big and it's a really important time for him because he's trying to stabilize that recruiting class because Satterfield mm -hmm. Satterfield had a really good class lined up we're already yeah. seeing some decommits like like Ruben Owens and mm -hmm. you know the one of their top linebackers Stan Quan Clark seems to be looking around a little bit so now Brahms got to come in and first of all I guess he he needs to decide you know are these all the recruits that I want to keep but some yeah. good players there and he's also got to get hit those in-home visits hard and try to keep those guys locked in very stressful for sure. And then we have news out of Chapel Hill. Uh, offensive coordinator Phil Longo from UNC has decided to take his talents to Wisconsin with Luke Fickle at who is now the new head coach. A lot of people were wondering whether or not that meant Drake May might be going to Wisconsin because they're in need of a quarterback. But Drake tweeted that he is, you know, born, bred, dead, there to stay, and he is not going anywhere. How could he ever leave this place? And, you know, I, I feel that because it's hard. But I'm glad that puts the rumors to bed, and he gets to find a new offensive coordinator with Mac Brown, and they figure out how to best move forward. But I know there was a lot of murmurs about whether or not he was going to go to greener, quote-unquote, greener pastures in SEC or Big Ten. Yeah, well, on on May, um, it's from from you and me, it's not unexpected that he's yeah. staying there because we've had this conversation before. Right. So I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. Well, I guess I'm not surprised, but I'm pleased that he's staying there. Um, and then with 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 Longo, it stinks to lose him. Like he's a yeah. great offensive coordinator. Tough to lose him out of the conference. Wisconsin's making great hires because I think uh, Fickle and Longo. I, I know this isn't uh, you know locked on Big Ten, but I, I'm impressed with what Wisconsin is doing. 
Yeah, yeah. And I think for Longo, listen, the best 80 yard coach you will ever see, that red zone, though, will oh. get you every time. <laughs> every time. For someone who witnessed that in Charlotte, best yeah. 80 yards you'll have out of the day. So, well, maybe if they pretend too. when they're inside the 20, if they just pretend they're on the 21, he might okay. be all right. He might actually do something. But, you know, he, he may uh, <laughs> Sam Howell look good. He makes Dre May look better. But I'm just hoping, wishing him all the best for all the good things. So now let's get into superlatives. I know it's not going to take long for us to talk about who the best team here in the ACC is but I challenge him with a few superlatives starting with that one and that is who should who do you feel who do you feel like let me try again I'm getting excited who do you feel like was the best team in the ACC yeah I wish I could give a more creative answer but <laughs> I, I I go with the conference champs I mean okay. Clemson they they won their big head-to-heads all year long and the Atlantic division was no picnic I mean yeah. impressive you know, Wake Forest really made them earn it with all those overtimes. It was that a four overtime game? Right. Uh, you know, uh, Florida State made it interesting in the end, and Florida State had a really good team this year, and then NC State. So that's just uh, it, not an easy schedule that Clemson got through. And I, I doubted them a little bit, Candace. I go back to preseason predictions. My pick to win the Atlantic division was uh, I think I went with NC State. I definitely didn't go with Clemson, which I should have, but I went with NC State to win the Atlantic. And, you know, it, it only took that kind of one year layoff for Clemson to come back and, and win big again. And, you know, now that they're going to be rolling uh, with Cade Klubnick uh, for the future, DJ's hitting the portal. Um, that offense is going to be really, really scary again next year, even scarier than they were this year. Yeah, you know what? I'm really hoping that Dabo gets on a podcast and just lays it all plain because I'm just confused as to why you stick stuck with DJ for so long. Like, why? And the vote of confidence and the doubling down was it your own stubborn? Like, I had to, this is my choice, so I'm going to make sure I see it through. Or you didn't, you know, what What was the reason to keep him when it was clear that the playbook opened up for Cade? And I saw that in the championship game. And it was just evident the entire energy of even the fans down to, you know, all the guys saying on the sideline, it shifted when Cade was on the field. So I'm just curious, Dabo, what, what were we doing? Yeah, you made a good point about, like, being able to open up the playbook as well because I, I think sometimes coaches really want to protect true freshmen, and maybe that's part of what Dabo was thinking because mm -hmm. you don't want to stunt their development. But, you know, when, when we saw Cade on the field, it, it didn't really seem like you needed to put handcuffs on the guy, right? right. Like, yeah, I, I definitely saw that with uh, – with Miami's true freshman quarterback, uh, Jakari Brown, who got some playing time this year. Like he looked really good against Georgia tech. He mm -hmm. struggled, struggled in all the other appearances that he made. And it was a lot of true freshman stuff, but I didn't see that with Cade Klubnik. Every time he was on the field, you would think, you know, he was, he was a senior and, and DJ was an un underclassman. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at the end of the day, if you just want to win, just say that. I honestly truly feel like if Cade had played a little bit longer and prepared himself for that South Carolina game, we'd be talking about Clemson in the college football playoff. I you know, agree. the ACC would have been saved. But here we are. <laughs> here we are. We're going to talk about the rest of these superlatives. But first, these days, every new potential hire can feel like high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates. That's why we ask you to look into LinkedIn jobs. All you got to do is go to LinkedIn.com and you can absolutely have yourself a grand old time by putting hashtag hiring in the purple frame in your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. We're rocking and rolling with Alex Dono of Locked on Canes podcast. Make sure you guys check him out and he talked about all things Hurricanes. I had some grand time with a lot of your Hurricanes fans in our comments from yesterday's show with AJ Black. He had oh, them no. at what the did you do? <laughs> he had them at the second to last worst team in the ACC this season. We did final rankings for everyone. And, you know, of mm. course, when you tell Hurricanes fans that, you know, they're the worst team, Immediately it is, oh, well, just wait till next year. And I said, frankly, how many times have we heard that? Wait till next season. Well, do, do, you know, do you know what the funny thing about that is, Candace? When, <laughs> when Hurricanes fans, when we talk amongst ourselves, we talk a lot about how bad they are. Yeah. You just don't want to hear it from other people. Oh, yeah. It's one of those things. It's like if you keep it in the family, like, oh, we we're so <laughs> bad this year. Yeah, we totally were. But then you hear – the locked on Boston college guys say it. You're like, Hey, what do you can't, we can call each other bad. You can't. 
hundred percent. It's just like your brother or sister, right? We can talk. I can talk about him like a dirty yeah. dog, but you're not gonna talk about him like a dirty dog. So no, I hundred percent get that. But that leads me to my next superlative: the worst team in the ACC this season. Who did you feel like deserves that honor? I feel like it's Virginia Tech. Um, okay, they were just and and you know I, I I watched them. I watched them play a handful of times this year, including mm -hmm. uh, against Miami. And you know they they had a little life near the end of the day, game because Miami committed seventeen penalties in the game, <laughs> kept a lot of them. But they're they're awful. Um, you know I also I I would just based on records I would have wanted to give some consideration to Boston College, but they had some good wins this year. I mean they beat NC State, they beat Louisville this year, so it's like for three and nine record, but like the wins were quality wins for Boston College. So I feel like it's definitely Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. um, you know I, I could put Miami in that conversation, but they weren't quite that bad. Um, and listen, I'm, I'm going to spare Virginia because of everything that they've gone through. And, and I'm really glad, by the way, I saw this today that they're going to grant an extra year of eligibility uh, to Virginia players, you know, after the tragedy. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with Virginia Tech. I mean, just a rough year for them. Yeah, I agree. I think, but it's hard because when you have a couple first year coaches like Mike Elko, you know, figured out Brent Key, he was interim, was be able to pick yeah. up some good wins and they were kind of delivering. It was like, all right, you know, Brett, <laughs> we're, what we got on, Mr. Pry? Like, well, what we got going on here? It feels like it's not going quite as to plan. You're supposed to bring the Virginia Tech of old and it's not even close to that like okay we're just gonna give you maybe it's too many remnants of Fuente and he really did do a lot of damage and they're trying to just recover and figure out who actually is talented enough to be up in Blacksburg but it feels like a long road we're gonna it's gonna be a two or three year kind of turning the curve there I I would say yeah I I kind of compare um uh, you know, in a few ways, I kind of compare Virginia Tech's situation to Miami's situation where it's more of like a demolition style rebuild. I think that's what they're doing there. Yeah, 100 percent. All right. Next superlative I had for you was the most improved team here in the ACC. Who did you feel like was that? It was a tug of war in my brain between okay. Syracuse and Florida State. But I'm going to go with Florida State because it's funny because okay. the first when I was first thinking about this, you know, my, my first impulse was like, and I know that they sputtered second half of the season, like they started six and oh, they finished one and five. So the mm -hmm. back nine was tough, but I, I really wanted to give Syracuse a lot of love because there were zero expectations for them this year, but there weren't many expectations for Florida state either. Yeah. And, and Florida state was, you know, one of the, uh, one of the more impressive stories I watched this year, because if you went by Mike Norvell's first couple of years there, yeah, from, I, I was thinking, man, like it's only a matter of time before they kick this guy to the curb. But financially, they were having trouble doing that because they were still paying Taggart and they yeah. paid all this buyout to for all that money they paid to Jimbo. Yeah. So it's like they're kind of stuck with Norvell. But then it like wasn't stuck with like, OK, mm -hmm. like the year three, he really turned it around. They did a great job working the transfer portal, just oozing with talent, that team. Um, I, I'm really interested to see. um how they kind of finish this recruiting cycle because yeah. like they had a very slow start in recruiting, but I think based on the season that they had, they're going to have a strong finish. So yeah. I, I think Florida state was the most improved team because that handful of years in a row, they hadn't even been bowl eligible, like three or four years, no bowl qualification. And, and they were one of the better teams in the conference. So I think they were the most improved. For sure. I'll be interested to see how many guys who probably wrote them off and with Norvell and things spin the block now that they've entered this transfer portal, like guys who are, you know, four and five star recruits who probably said, nah, they came down to, you know, a couple of decisions. But now you see kind of the trajectory and what Jordan Travis really brought this season and where that offense is going and the health of that defense. There's a, there's a lot of positive things, really, if you look at Florida State. There's a lot of upswing. They like and I think say. Jordan Travis, um, he could be a Heisman candidate next year. Yeah. I, I think, I think he's trending in that direction he's going to be a player to watch don't say that alex i don't because... like it as i don't like it any more than you do believe me I mean, look at look at the hat i'm wearing i don't want it <laughs> the florida state people in my mentions would never let me live that down because i said he's a switch positions and he won't be an nfl quarterback and you thought i would have said his grandmama you know has four buck teeth but, you know, I was just like, listen, I like the guy. I think he's a great runner. You know, all the things. We've got to work on the accuracy. That's all I wanted. Yeah. And he's done that. He shut me right on up. And I told everybody as such. So the Heisman thing, I always, you know, I got a little snippy. And I said, Jordan for Heisman. So if that becomes true, it has. To, I can't be rude about it. So it's going to be very interesting to see. But all right, let's go on to the next superlative. We had the biggest surprise, a player or team this season. 
Ooh, uh, biggest surprise. I think this one, um, I'm going to give it to Miami and for okay. negative reasons, right? Because, you know, um, <laughs> and and obviously every, everyone who knows me knows I love the U more than anything in the world. Yeah. And, and part of my loving the U so much was overrating them <laughs> so much. <laughs> And I know I'm not the only one, right? Yeah. Because they, they were showing up on a lot of these lists of most improved teams, like heading into the season. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was just a disaster. I mean, uh, you know, five and seven for the first time since I think 2007 was the last time they, they were below 500. They'd had a couple of 500 years uh, since then, but below 500. Um, I'm still optimistic about the future, but I think we overestimated the the past and present. Um, yeah. The offensive line uh, was not only not very good, but really decimated by injury. Um, you know, Tyler Van Dyke, I think his development was a little bit stunted. He figured it out a bit, but then he started getting hurt left and right. Unfortunately, he had a, a couple games where he was turning the corner. Uh, I, I think that the coaching changes, um, maybe I, I, he was messing with his mechanics a little bit. And, and I mm -hmm. think, you know, he kind of, for for the better, reverted back to to what, what it made him successful. Last year, um, you know, the, the defense was really good at times, really porous at times. And yeah, in a season where you found a way to lose to Middle Tennessee, you know, you got you got pummeled by Duke. You got pummeled by your biggest rival in Florida State. You lost yeah. more games than you won. I, yeah. I would say for a Miami team that I, I thought was going to win about nine games this year, to be five and seven with all these flashy new coaches and flashy new toys. I think they'll get it right in the long run, especially with the way that they're hitting the recruiting trail. But yeah. th that was the biggest surprise for me in a negative way. Yeah. You know, they, I picked them to win the coastal. So I, I was all in on the coaching staff and I felt like Tyler Van Dyke from what I saw last season, I was like, Oh hell yeah. Like they're going to be scary sight. You know, I think it's just, they maybe needed someone beyond Manny, but I'm starting to say, was Manny actually the problem? It's, it's, it's unclear to me. Do you think that there is optimism going into next season for the hurricanes? Uh, there, there's always going to be because, yeah. uh, they, they, they do this thing where they, they always win the off season, right? Okay. So it's at this point, it's like, you've got to show that you can develop players. And, yeah. and, and, and that's the challenge for this coaching staff because the last couple of staffs couldn't, and I, I'm, I'm not a Manny Diaz fan whatsoever because yeah. I know, I know the inconsistencies with the way Diaz was not holding anybody accountable and it just, the inmates were running the asylum. And I think that that was a big problem <laughs> that hurt Miami's locker room culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not just me saying that, that that was a big thing that maybe some people don't realize or some people choose to ignore. So I, yeah. I do think Diaz was a major problem. I just, you know, not now it's up to Cristobal to fix it because it hasn't been fixed yet. Yeah. And for me, I would say that North Carolina it has a coaching problem issue as well in terms of development, like you're talking about. I think we've, we're starting to see as much as we're hiding it with winning and masking it, the last four games is very evident by the fact that, you know, you're 0 and 4 for backup quarterbacks. That's telling. You're telling on yourselves when you're telling me that you're not preparing for all things in all possible scenarios, right? I want you to be a film junkie. I want you to make sure you have every single play opportunity to make your players successful. And it just feels like, that hasn't been the case. But from a larger standpoint, a lot of our coastal teams are going to be looking from the outside in for the next couple of years and they don't figure it out because there's no more divisions. And I don't want yeah. it to be like Miami at the bottom, North Carolina in the mid, you know, tier stuff like that. And I don't want it to just be a Clemson and Florida State, you know, kind of scenario for years to come. I, I would hope that we can find some coastal goodness. Yeah, I, I would hope so too, because yeah. it's going to be, and, and I know, with the, I'm very sentimental with certain things. I'm mm -hmm. going to keep looking at the coastal teams, even though there's no more coastal. Cause like, I still have a soft spot for old school, big East teams. Like yeah. sometimes I'll see West Virginia on TV and I'm like, big East, let's go. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I've got this weird thing. And, uh, yeah. and, and it's like, even, you know, in the ACC, you know, I know Maryland hasn't been in the ACC for a few years. Sometimes I see Maryland on TV and it's like pulling at my uh, my ACC heartstrings. <laughs> Absolutely. And Maryland will actually be playing NC State in a bowl game. So it'll really be a throwback oh, yeah. for all of us and fun times. And if you're trying to get in on any of the bowl betting action, I strongly encourage you guys to hit up betonline.net. You have plenty of opportunities. The first one being December 17th with that Fenway Bowl between Louisville and Cincinnati. There's no reason that should be spicy at all. Of course not. Get the latest odds and trends 
wins for every professional and amateur league out there from basketball to football, soccer, esports, and more. BetOnline.net has you covered. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more because BetOnline is where the game starts. We are finishing up here with Alexander of Locked on Canes. Make sure you check out all of his material everywhere because it is so important to get caught up when that Canes action gets to roll and he is right there in the thick of it. Now, a couple more superlatives that we want to go through. The 2023 Witch Program to Watch superlative what would you say who is who do you have your eyes on going into next season i can't give you just one if that's okay <laughs> i don't know if i'm uh, yeah. I don't know if i'm cheating in the game don't but cheat it's, it's, it's fine it's fine <laughs> um yeah you know uh i'm i'm definitely going to be watching duke because okay. i thought that they were they were really ahead of schedule based on how bad they were last year of cut cliff and i didn't i didn't think mike elko could have them look this promising this quickly yeah. so i so it's always like are you going to follow up on that because we can't always just assume that like a good first year for a new staff necessarily means you're going to get inc incrementally better every single year so is duke sure. going to be able to sustain that especially you know without uh, without the coastal division next year you're probably gonna have a tougher schedule yeah. uh so that that's definitely one that i'm looking at and kind of kind of in the same vein like same logic i'm definitely gonna be watching syracuse next mm -hmm. year because mm -hmm. they were the sweetheart of college football for the first six games and then you know the cinderella how does that go the other shoe dropped right yeah. the whole cinderella <laughs> analogy because you know they started six and oh and you know they had adversity uh through injuries and everything the second half of the season but you know, a one and five finish after a six and zero oh start is always going to be uh, disheartening. So I want to see how Syracuse, because I'm a big Dino Babers fan, and I'm a big uh, Aronde, Aronde Gadsden the second fan. Mm -hmm. I know his father very well, and just mm -hmm. an awesome family. So I, I want to see how that they how they can follow up from that year. And then I guess uh, if you look at kind of a different logic, um, you know, teams who were successful this year, how can they build on that? Uh, I'll say Florida State uh, once again, because, you know, can they turn a good team into a great team? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, North Carolina, because, you know, you talked about player development and knowing that Drake May is not going anywhere, but you do have to make a transition at offensive coordinator. How are they going to look next year? And then, you know, selfishly, I'm always going to be looking at Miami because, yeah. hey, if there's going to be people out there, I'm going to try not to do it. Uh, they're going to be predicting nine or ten wins again like like we seem to do every year. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be a very young team next year because I think they're going to rely on uh, on a lot of the uh, the redshirt freshmen, true sophomores, and some of the true freshmen coming in. So yeah. I'm definitely curious to see how they look. And with Tyler Van Dyke coming back, which was maybe a mild surprise yeah. to some people, uh, you know, can he get protection up front? And can he look more like the 2021 TVD than the 2022 TVD? Absolutely. I think for me, it's like Louisville and Georgia Tech because they both have alumni coaches. And so it's like how bringing the pride back and bringing all the energy. That's kind of what bringing Mac Brown back for the second time around did for North Carolina. And it's made a good change in all the things. So can Louisville kind of add to that energy? Can Georgia Tech, now that they're going to figure out who's going to be their next quarterback, can they find a way to bring back, you know, the Georgia Tech of old in terms of just having some real strong candidates and, you know, making people have some off nights. I don't think Georgia Tech is going to be necessarily the best team out, but they're definitely going to make, you know, disturb the peace a little bit. I also feel like Boston College, you know, I'm going to say Happily might be on watch. I don't know. It, it feels yeah. like unless there's some big changes from that offensive line, it's going to be another long season. And I don't know how much big of a leash they're going to give him. And in that same vein, talking well, about I can tell you on yeah. that because Boston College's athletic director is a former Miami athletic director. Yeah. It's got to be really bad. Like, <laughs> like, like, oh, and 12 bad before yeah. Lake James makes a change. Like, if, okay. If, like he he he's good. He's probably going to be like napping through most of the season next year. Like if if you're expecting a coaching coaching change, it's got to be catastrophically <laughs> bad before he makes it. Is he real loyal, or he just doesn't like to spend the money to have people sit down and do nothing? He does not like to rock the boat. Mm. Uh, he is he's he's more of just my impression. Uh, he's you know he's he's just more more of a yes man like yeah. it's it, it's going to come down to more of and i don't know a whole lot about boston college's tran uh like chancellor's office or president's office like i, I don't really know the personality of like their uh 
of their leadership and board of trustees and all that. But, you know, wh whatever they want is what Blake is going to do. He's not going to yeah. take too many risks. Uh, I feel that. And then speaking of Boston College, you know, Phil Dracovic going to Pitt. Pitt was in desperate need of a quarterback. And now that they're getting it, they didn't lose a whole lot of talent from the receiving core. They've always had a pretty good defense. So they could be one of the better teams of our former coastal, you know, division to actually make some noise and be up there in the rankings. So I'm interested to see how that pans out. Yeah, it's a it's a good call. There's there's actually very few teams I'm not interested in <laughs> next year, right? Because it's it's a very I mean, I guess we didn't bring up Wake Forest yeah. or NC State, but I'm I'm curious to see what they look like as well. Yeah, if NC State, you know, gets rid of Tim Beck, maybe they're a great team. They lost Devin Leary, yeah. you know, but at the end of the day, Did MJ Morris. like a, almost, what is it, five ACC starting quarterbacks from last year are in the portal. That, that's, uh, I guess it's, I don't, it's like 40% of uh, yeah. of the starting quarterbacks in the yeah. portal. That, that's crazy. Yeah, and I think just from what we talk about so much of the ACC and having good quarterback play, it's crazy to me that so many are leaving because we that is kind of like our staple. And now it's like, yeah, everyone's trying to find a new home. Home. And I guess this is very much the ramifications of the NIL and wanting to have better opportunities and the transfer portal being so easily you can just go after one year and immediately play because, you know, back when I was in school, that wasn't an option. So it just feels like everyone's always trying to find a happy home. But as I tried to say before we got on air, the grass is not always greener. <laughs> you might not find a home. You might be talking about some guys returning, maybe without scholarships when it's all said and done. So. <laughs> yeah, because I think some guys are like, oh, this is great. I'm going to hit the portal and yeah. my phone's going to be ringing off the hook. But yeah. that's not the case for everyone. Some of these guys <laughs> are going to hit the portal. They're like, wait, the, the phone's not ringing. What's happening here? Exactly. It is going to be a sad sight. Well, we are going to make sure that we keep you in the loop for all things. We might bring you back for some uh, – uh, trap game bowl games you know if, if you're willing if you want to come in and have a good time with us but Alex can you remind these folks of where they can find you and follow your work yeah so it's recruiting season so we're very very busy uh at locked on canes on twitter is where you find the show you see where you can find my personal at Alex Dono and you can find the show locked on canes apple Podcasts, odyssey spotify youtube wherever you get your pods there we are locked on canes Love it. Guys, come back tomorrow. We'll have Jersey Drake in the building. We'll get you ready for not only for superlatives, but also for some basketball action heading into the weekend. For Candace Cooper and Alex Dono, until next time.